Hello Lee, thank you for agreeing to this interview. I'll be asking you a couple of questions, mainly in regards to uh, the media expose of January and February 2019. Are you prepared to answer a couple of my questions? Absolutely. Why? Well, I think it's time that the world knows the truth. Coming from a forensic investigator, right? When you came forward in twenty in January twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. of who you suspect you may be, there was a lot of negative media coverage about you being a con artist and a scamster. How did you feel about that? Well, I was torn apart. It put a lot of stress on my health. Why do you think you were torn apart? Because I came out with the truth and I was framed as a scamster. It's like the world wasn't ready or didn't want the truth to come out. Now that the truth is out, how did we complete the investigation? How do you feel? Ecstatic. Answers that I've been looking for for almost 30 years. It's all there. I no longer have to fight and prove who I am. You remember the time we went to Kwazulu Natal, December 2019? Mm -hmm. How was your feelings driving from East London to oh, Peter Maritzburg? I was emotional. I never wanted to see Durban again. Did you anticipate in your journey to Peter Maritzburg what we may find? Not at all. You just went with the flow? Correct. You didn't give us much warning. I wasn't prepared. Were you afraid facing the past? Yes, I was. Why would that be? There are many evil men, as you, as you know, still connected to the network. And I think I was just not ready to to face, see that again. The places that I had to live in. Day one in Peter Maritzburg, mm -hmm. when we woke up that morning at the hotel. Mm -hmm. You drove into the direction of Clarendon. Correct. Can you take us through your emotions, your feelings as we drove into that area? I had mixed emotions, but um, I knew where I was. The place was of familiarity to me. I knew that the school would be on your left. Um, images around me started becoming clearer and I felt like this was where I grew up. And then we stopped at the school, right? Yeah. What happened then? Flashbacks, memories just hit me. 
and I was so overthrown with I began I began crying. What was the first memory that you can remember? The very first was the gate that I entered in <clears throat> to get into the school premises. And then of course my name being carved into a tree, the name Fee. When did you get that memory? It was it was just in me. And there were three trees that I could see from the car. And my memory didn't serve me correct as which tree I wrote my name on or engraved my name on. So I searched all three. I remember you asked me, what am I doing? What am I looking for? And the excitement, knowing that I'm going to find initially my name, um, overthrew me. And when you asked me the second time, I answered you. I told you before I had found my name, that my name wasn't carved or engraved in the tree. And when I got to the third tree, there it was. When I stopped at the school, you got out of the vehicle, right? Right. And you walked away from us. Correct. At what point did you feel you want to go and investigate something? The minute I climbed out the car. Feeling the atmosphere. Taking me back to the past. The memory hit me. And I knew I was going to find it. And I think that's why I left you at the car. It was something I needed to do. And there it was. What was written on the tree? P. F. I. You can see that it had been for many years. It, the tree had grown. <clears throat> I obviously wasn't that length when I engraved it. But it was there. It's still there to, to this very day. Can you remember how you engraved it? With a stone, sh sharp stone. I remember it was an everyday process. It wasn't just once off. Do you remember when you engraved this? When I was attending the school. Would you do that before school, after school? Before and after. More time after school. Do you remember any of the teachers at the school? Miss what do you remember about her? Very caring. Showed me a lot of support. Understanding. I mean, for any minor, I think there's a certain teacher that everyone would remember. And she stands out the most for me. Helping me with my disabilities. Learning disabilities. When did you remember her name? When I remembered her name in East London. Um, well, actually remembered more of her in East London. In Before I had met you. Um... I constantly told my friend about her as a teacher that I knew. That's before the year 2019, right? Before 2017, way back. So her name always stuck to your mind? Always. 
and if I understand you correctly, in 2019 when you came to East London, memories about her and others just became more vivid to you. Correct. Back at the school in December 2019, Claridon Primary School, when we visited Claridon area, you said that your memories just flooded mm. after we stopped at the school. Mm. So many things look familiar to you. Yeah. Do you remember any of the children? I remember a Gerald who suffered epileptic fits. Um, Simone, a girl that I used to walk home with, that lived in the same area I did. Um, I don't recall many of my classmates um, or many of my friends as such. I know that I'm an introvert, always been shy, um, loved reading, loved animals, and I find my own way of entertainment, always been that way. Now, subsequent to our visit in KwaZulu Natal and Peter Marisburg area in December 2019, you started to have memories of the house that you stayed in prior to you being kidnapped in, 20, in, in 1988. Correct. The bedroom that you slept in, can you describe it to me? Well, firstly it didn't face the front of the house. It would be more on the side or the back. Um, I remember I had a single bed, little dressing table, a cupboard in the bedroom, um, little block tiles and of course where my hockey stick laid and where I put my bag Can you describe your bed to me? My bed My bed had a wooden headrest also as well as a foot headrest and um, I just remember it being a single bed and your dressing table? My dressing table had an oval mirror which was mounted to the dressing table. You could swing it. Um, I remember it had drawers on the side and also a little chair that was made for the dressing table. You said you remember the floors? Yes. Can you describe it to me? Wooden. And it was, the shape was little blocks with little blocks in them. They would easily fall out if you played with them. Were there any carpets in the room? There was a mat. Um, I'm sh it was near the door or just between the bed and the door. Okay. When you walk into your bedroom, can you take me through where the cupboard, the bed and the dressing table be? Okay, so if you walk into the bedroom, on your left hand side would be the cupboard. My dressing table would be by the window on the right. And my bed would be on the left. So that the, the window would be situated so that the sun can fall onto the bed. Is how I would imagine it. How I could see it. Do you remember what you see if you walk out of your bedroom? If I walk out of my bedroom, I can remember seeing on your left a kitchen area and a passage and a lounge. You indicated earlier that you don't have much memory of your parents or any siblings, correct? Correct. 
Do you have any memories of adults in the house and what they were doing at the time? I remember a woman seeing me off at the gate. Um, I can remember a man that would smoke pipe in the house. Um, I can remember a dog. I love my animals. I still have a great bond with animals. But most of it is a vague memory. Could you possibly describe the dog or maybe have a name for it? What I remember is Buddy. But then again, I must say throughout my life, I've had many dogs. But that name sticks out for me. As an animal lover, I've owned many animals and given them many names. So I can't be 100% accurate that my dog's name was Buddy at that time. I also remember that I enjoyed what they would call pen pals, writing letters to friends and so forth. How would you send these letters when received? Well, I would receive it in my post box and obviously the grown-ups would take it to the post office. I don't remember ever going to a post office. In December 2019, during our visit in Peter Maddisburg, do you remember whether you pointed out any areas other than the school? Yes. I pointed out a cul-de-sac and I told you that's where I met Tracy on holiday and she became one of my pen pals. I've also pointed to you just before my house a mechanic or someone that was a mechanic that did their work in the, in the yard. Also, I've pointed to you at a red um, tin box um, and the abduction area. Do you remember a corrugated house? Yes. Simone's house. The red box or metal box, where was it? Just before you go down Moreland Street. Would you pass this box on your way from home to school? Yes. Can you take me through what you remember when you showed me the place where you were abducted? Well, you and I and my friend were sitting in the restaurant, not far from the adoption side, and a memory hit me, and just as you go around from that restaurant, which is now a restaurant, it wasn't a restaurant back then, there was a church. And I was looking for the church, but I couldn't find it. But yet there is a building there, in a very old building, and you could see by the tinted windows that it was once a church, which is today, um, I believe, it and a park, which now looks it looks like a field. Um, I remember pointing out to you where the swings were, the merry-go-round, the tyres, everything that we used to play on. Um, I've never known of a mask or graveyards that were further up. But in that park, that is where I remember the abduction happened. As I took you right through the whole scene. You can also see the back of the school, the sports field. Newspaper articles of that time suggest that Fiona Harvey left home to buy milk 
at a cafe not far from this park. Do you have any memories of that? Absolutely none. And that's just the thing about media. They can speculate, but they don't know the truth. If you were a fraudster, a con artist, or mentally ill. Or mentally disturbed. Do you think you could take information from the media and tell that story later and add milk to your story? Look, no I don't to answer you that. And secondly, if I were a fraudster and did half the things the media said I did, that they attacked me on, or was mentally ill, um, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in an institution where people would look after me. Um, I'm plainly a victim and I want to tell my story and that of others I can't speak today. I don't think it is possible for anyone unless they are very, very good at it. And even then there would be slip ups because a lie builds on a lie, builds on a lie, builds on a lie. And you will be caught out to try and make this story into, or take evidence, it, it's just impossible. It's impossible. I have a memory loss problem due to trauma due to drugs that were forcefully given. Um, I have head trauma and um, I find it impossible to even remember small details. But yet certain things stuck to you. Yeah, memories. A certain scent, um, a song, Small things, like when we got to Clarendon. Um, you didn't tell me where my school was or that we were near a school. Uh, you didn't tell me, well, you, you didn't give me any information, basically. And when the memory hits, I knew. I knew you left, it would be the school. Um, the abduction area, that was the last time I had been in Clarendon. And... Um, I could tell you where the bucky stood. I didn't see the man, Mr. Van Royen. I only saw the woman. And I remember in short conversations that we had. I remember looking onto the field, which is now field, sorry, at the park where the children were playing. And of course, the sound of their voices disappearing and I was taken. I can also tell you that a memory that has been with me all my life and that is that I've always been tomboy. Um, I've always had the name Fifi. And prior to what the media attacked me on when I tried to come out and attacked you on, <clears throat> I only feel that people attack if they need to hide something. And I just came out with the truth. Hopefully, I thought the police could help, which was my greatest mistake when I did come out in 2018 because they published my ID, they gave my information to certain individuals that obviously was not in the police force and had no business having my information. <clears throat> So yes. Going back to the negative media publications in January and February 2019. Mm -hmm. These articles also had photographs or images in it, right? Correct. How do you feel someone publishing your identity card? Look, 
Do you want to do it for straight knee? Um, it's my, it's, it's personal. And um, to think that they could publish my name and not take me to the police station and call me a fraudster, living on a name that doesn't belong to me, living on an age that doesn't belong to me. Um, nothing was done about it, yet I was just named. They even hacked into my phone, got into my Facebook, taken certain pictures out that were of my privacy. Um, they went as far as to say that I had stolen children. I feel the media doesn't know me as a person, as an individual. And for a mother, I'm speaking on the slander the media threw out at me, saying that I ate children. They do not know me. I'm a mother who has lost her child. And those type of remarks were uncalled for unprofessional and if any victim had to come forward today I don't think they would easily come forward with the police and the media attacking the way they did you refer to the media that would include social media right that includes social media yes Now, this couldn't have been an easy journey since January 2019. Were there any consequences of the negative media to you personally? Yes, my health. Um, I've had terrible heart pains, heart spasms, um, reliving memories, which I've had to done I've had to do in this interview with you, in this case, um, every day it was a nightmare of reliving something that as a newborn Christian lets go of and now has to go back into certain things to relive it, to explain where it happened, who the individuals were, what we went through, what I saw, and you know, it, it had a major impact on my health. Um, because of my disabilities, I don't, I can't work. I'm on a, on a, I'm on a grant, and my grant does not allow me to have certain medical sufficiencies. So yes, it did have a, medic a huge impact on me. And when I did come out, my, well, should I say my friend's restaurant had a huge impact. We lost customers. It was easy for people to call me a scamster than to listen to the story and put the facts together. Um, today we sit without our shop, our, our restaurant because of this and I'm not here to judge anyone this presentation of yours my interview with you is to be the voice of those that are afraid to come out and those that did not make it without going into much detail are you convinced that some of these girls did not make it alive? Yes. And you were a witness to that? I was a witness, yes. May I just mention some girls? I'm not talking about the six. Alleged. I'm talking about more. Thousands more. That were not mentioned. Now, you speak English very well. Correct. Are you familiar with any other languages? 
I can speak Zulu, Dates, or I can understand and speak to a certain extent. German. Yeah. Um, I've grown to learn the language of Afrikaans, although I can't speak it fluently. Um, but I am English based. It's my, my tongue, my mother tongue. I want to take you back to January 2019, before your interview with the Sunday Times. Okay. You and I had a interview at a hotel in East London. Correct. And the interview was videographed. Do you you remember me asking you to introduce yourself? Correct, I do. Can you remember what happened? Yes, I said I am Fiona Elizabeth Harvey. Where is Elizabeth coming from? The moment you asked me to introduce myself, it felt natural, it was a memory, and that's how it came out. I can't give you any further explanations. As I've tried today, which is now 2020, to even Google the name Fiona Elizabeth, it's nowhere on record or available to the public. So it, it, it was a clear memory. You've never told me information about that. I'm sure you were shocked yourself to hear me say that, but that's what I remember. Right. Now, there has been a question in general by the media. Mm -hmm. Why did it take you so long to come out? Well, it actually didn't. If the media has to understand, that I've been trying to do this all my life. By means of my own going to the police, giving them the wrong names, like Jacqueline Sloan, uh, Phoebe Smith, obviously there would be no record. Um, my ways of trying to find the, the truth about myself had always failed me. And in 2019, when I met you, um, you were prepared to help me at no cost. And with your expertise, and I mean, you've done many court cases, you've spoken to many victims, even suspects. Um, I felt comfortable and knew this way was the proper way. 2019 wasn't my first time trying to come out. That's an incorrect statement. It's just something that the media was misinformed about. I had been trying to find the truth my whole life. During your interview with the Sunday Times in January 2019, you made reference to a street father. Yeah. Can you remember if you were initially truthful to me about that? No, I wasn't truthful to you nor my friend about this individual, this Dallas. Um, I felt I needed there to be one person in my life that didn't misuse me. Look, he did in his way take care of me. I did eat, I had a place to sleep, um, but I resented that and I was, was very angered at what he did with me 
to me, how he treated me. And yes, I did lie about that. It's not easy telling a story where everything is just bad. I wanted some light shed that someone was good for me, had good intentions of me, and it was not right of me to do that. I felt uncomfortable with that. And that's when I confronted you in 2019 and to my friend and apologized for, for lying. I can't, I can't withhold the fact that my life up to now has not been good, it has changed now, but I'm not going to give him any credit for what he has not done. Shortly after you met Dallas for the very first time, at some point you requested him take you home. Correct. Can you take us through that day? In that, that specific day I was looking for food and um, he was in the parking area. He approached me seeing that I was looking for food and he asked me, um, less was the word, are you hungry? And me being cautious over men, I nodded yes. And he left the vehicle and he went into the, to the shop. He bought me bread and a little milk and we spoke. I don't remember everything we said, but he initially offered to take me home. And I assumed as a little girl, he would just know where I live. It's not something I thought, gave much thought of. I mean, I was scared first time on the streets and someone's going to take me home. So eventually he did take you home? What I thought was, yes. And when I got to the the house that I thought I'd recognize, you know, back when I was a child, all the houses looked similar. And um, the house that we went to was empty. I remember looking through the, through the windows and yeah, no one was there. I didn't realize it was not the home that I lived in and that he could have not known where I lived. So his intentions was not to take me home. Prior to take he, pro, prior taking you to the house you thought were your parents' house, mm -hmm. he physically abused you. Yeah. Over a couple of days. Yeah. And you don't recall the discussion you had with him. And then he took you to an area. Mm -hmm that you believed might be the area you're coming from. Exactly, yes. Did anything look familiar in that area like it was in December 2019? Like I said, the houses looked familiar. But I mean, it could be in any suburb. It could be Pine Town, it could have been Maritzburg, it could have been Durban. I was just gullible and wanted to go home. I was malnourished, I was hungry, and I was desperate. If this man took you to your parents, do you think your parents would have taken his details? You know, I think about it now in my adult years. At that time, at that age, it didn't cross my mind, but as I'm sitting here today with you, no. Do you think it would be in his 
best interest to take it to your parents? No. Would it be in his best interest to expose himself to possible criminal? Absolutely not. Okay. And then subsequent to the empty house that he took you to, did he at some point take you to the police station? He did. He told me he knew or was friends with a lot of uh, policemen. I declined. I said I did not want to go. And he persuaded me that I did not have to climb out, that I could be seated in the car. And his, he will speak to friends of his, which I believe was in Peter Marisburg. And yes, he stopped there, he got out. Later on, a man came with a file, didn't question me, he looked at me, he folded through the file, and went back in. Dallas came back out and told me he had found a family to take me to. And, I mean, at that time there was no cell phone, no GPS locations, but he knew exactly where to go. And I didn't think of it then. And that's when I met the Boerters. They're all Afrikaans speaking, right? Huh? Correct. And you are pure English speaking? Correct. And this is the family now claiming to be your family? Correct. The gentleman that today claims to be your brother, Melvin, mm -hmm. when you arrived at this house after the police station, did you see him around? I saw him only at the boys' house. He was much younger than I. Um, I don't even recall if we had communication. I won't go into much detail with that right now, but um, yeah, I don't recall him knowing me as a family member. All right. So there was a time prior to 2019 that you got a communication from Melvin again. Correct. How did that happen and when was this? Well, I was on Facebook. I am on Facebook. And um, my name was Lee Sloan. The name that I'm living under, Lee. And he contacted me via Messenger. It's, it's an application on Facebook asking me if we could be related. Um, I told them I think we could, playing along with maybe here's my opportunity to get information as to who I am. And the man clearly didn't know who I was after I sent a photo. In fact, he was trying to come on to me in, in, in the message and I decided to ignore him thereafter. Do you remember more or less what year this was? I've got everything. I've got all the screenshots yet. My memory doesn't serve me well. Okay, but was it before or after the January media articles 2019? It was way before that. Okay. Do I understand you correctly that you sent Melvin a photograph of you? Yes. When I, it, that photograph was taken in 2013. And he didn't recognize you as his sister? No, he complimented me as you would come onto a lady. More or less, yes. 
yet after January 2019, he claims to be your my brother. brother. Correct. My elder brother. Your elder brother. Correct. And are you Melvin's sister? No, I am not. I cannot meet a family and just become blood family. But I do believe Jacqueline Sloan is, whoever she may be. The identity that was given to me by Mrs. Boerter. Um, I do feel sorry for the Sloans and the Boerters. The, the, the children I'm speaking of because I do believe they knew a Jacqueline Sloan and they are assuming that I am that sister um, but I'm not and I'd like the real Jacqueline Sloan to be found and there's a lot of questions that, that need to be filled in there too as to where she is and why I I am sitting with her identity. Let's get back to your son. Can you remember the date your son was born? On the 29th. 29th? What September. Month? September. You know what year? It must have been 1991, if I'm correct. Sorry, I'm not very good with figures and dates. Okay. Now, you apparently related a story to other people before we met in January 2019 mm -hmm. that there was a police raid mm -hmm. at the place where you and your son stayed. Correct. Now, where was this location and what happened on that day? The location is just across Durban Harbour. As you would come into Durban, you'd see the harbour. It's just opposite the towers or right next to the towers um, there was a police raid there, as there were many prostitutions living in that one flat with these Nigerians um, it was also drug related and prostitution and yes that's where the raid took place um, I walked with my son down the stairs wrapped up in a blanket and I got into the crowd to try and keep my son safe and later on when everything was calm and clear I went back into the flat as my son's medication was still there. During the police raid when you got outside of the building downstairs what did you see? I saw reporters, I saw lots of flashing lights, I'm not talking about the police vans. Um, there was a woman with a microphone, yeah and reporters and people standing taking photos and videos. Do you think it's possible that you've been captured on film or video? No, I know I have. And then at some point your son passed on. Correct. How old, how old was he more or less? He was about two months. Okay. And years later, it came to your attention that there was a witness remembering seeing the police raid on national TV. Actually, there's many witnesses, but they just couldn't give me the accurate date. In time, 
the one did and could remember it very well as she was in that vicinity on vacation um, but there's a lot of people that have had seen this this specific episode on, on carte blanche and on the news um, yeah can you think of any reason why people would remember seeing this on TV more than 30 years later? Yes, I was a very young girl. I was probably 13, 14. And here I am holding a little baby. And um, I'm mixed up with all these wrong people. And at that time, it was a very big thing or drug raids and prostitution and so forth. Ironically, the missing individual was standing right in front of them and they did not see me, question me, take my fingerprints. And if they had done that all those years ago, I wouldn't have to have Wasted my, my life trying to prove who I am. You always remembered the day and month your son was born, right? Correct. And until recently, during your investigation, you battling remembering dates or mm -hmm. figures as a result of your medical condition. Mm -hmm. We eventually put your timeline together mm. based on this police raid. Mm. And that was the first time that you actually could figure out what year your son was born and when he passed on. And that was very significant for me. Yeah. In Back in December 2019, when we visited KZN, <coughs> we also went to a cemetery in Durban, where you recovered the remains of your son. Was your son's birth ever registered? No. Why? I was a child when I gave birth to him. I was still a child when he passed away. Um, basically, Mr. Brown's Nigerians were in control of everything. Um, I didn't even have something to put him in when they put him in the, in the furnace to, to cremate him. I didn't, I had to find a mayonnaise bottle. And later on in life, I put him in a plastic bag in someone else's box and engraved on the wall his name. You say someone else's box, like in another grave? In another, in the memorial wall. Have you ever been arrested or been to prison? Yes. Would you like to tell me about it? Well, yes, okay. Um, I tried to remove someone's tools, manhood, and um, I didn't succeed, obviously. But I was taken to the police station and I was arrested. The media articles and comments on Facebook suggested that your youthful appearance serves as evidence that your brother, who claims to be older than you, is correct that you are in fact his sister. 
Why would you have a youthful appearance? Well, let me break it down short for you. A victim, any victim for that matter, has still a child in them. They've never had that opportunity to grow up. And I'm going to go into more detail of that just now. So the way they speak, the way they think, and the way they dress is still very childlike. And to discuss it more, when a victim is in human trafficking, it is almost like being trained to become a soldier. You are given certain exercises, um, diets, um, because they want the child look. It's what sells in, in human trafficking. And the younger you appear, the more sales come in for those that do human trafficking. So yes, I've had to live that way for many, many, many years. And it's something that my body is adapted to. Um, also because I'm very small. Um, it's, it's something that came naturally. Makeup, the way I dress, the way I approach things, the way I think. Would it be fair to assume that you have lost your youth or your natural growth processes? My natural growth processes, yes. Um, it took me almost eight years when I came to the Lord to learn how to count in numbers and numerals, to tell time. Um, these things I've never had a privilege doing it was either day or it was night um, taking responsibilities um, caring for yourself apart from dressing for a client um, natural responsibilities so yes it was it, it, you, can, you can say it was basically stolen from me it's something that I've had to learn over the years to do. It's not something that's natural to me. I'm still learning. Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for a victim who was a child to respond in an, in, in an adult way their voice, their ways, their, their thinkings. It's very much different to that of a person that has never endured such hardships of human trafficking. Like I said, you are trained as a soldier, would, and that never leaves you. How old are you now? I'm 43. Are you willing to cooperate in a criminal investigation? Of course. Would you be prepared one day to testify in court if it ever comes to that? If it ever does, yes, I'm prepared. I have nothing to hide. What places did we visit in KZN? That's of significance. Many places of Mr. Brown, um...
Fifth Avenue, Dallas's place, we are slept in the park. Um, what? Let me ask you this question. You've mentioned that Dallas, after taking you to the police, has taken you to someone you now suspect he knew, the workers. Yes. And at some point, you left the workers. Correct. And it's your evidence that you believe that the Buertas has sold you to a certain Mr. Brown. Correct. During our visit in Durban in December 2019, you showed me several locations where you were held captive by Mr. Brown and those in his employment. During your investigation the past two years, was the true identity of Mr. Brown established? You know, in many ways, yes. You identified a photo of him, right? Correct. And of his associates. Mr. Brown is not his real name, is it? No. Right. Let's talk about a lady by the name of Louise. Okay. You remember the first time you saw or met Louise? Yes. You want to tell me about it? Was here in East London. And um, we didn't speak much. She wanted to speak with me. Um, but at that time, I was given instruction not to speak to anybody um, because of the media. So we didn't have our talk. We didn't communicate. But I did know of her and I did know that her name was Louise. You didn't recognize her then, did you? No. She was very ill. Did you have any subsequent discussions with Louise? Over her phone, yes. During those telephonic discussions, did she reveal any information that helped you identify, confirm who you are, where you're coming from? There were confirmations and there were also questions, which answered the confirmations. Um, she asked me if I remembered being in a certain club called the and I said yes. Um, she recalled seeing me there. She asked me if I can remember that she loosened my braids that I had on. And I remember a lady doing that. Um, Louise's appearance had changed over many years due to her illness so it, w it was quite difficult to place her at that spot but yes I do remember that and then she told me that two other girls of the alleged six were with me in that club and I could not believe it um, I don't even think they knew who I was because we change, we had to wear makeup, I had braids, um, our hairs were dyed, we were given names. Apart from Smith, I was given club names, you know, like Raven and Scarlet and 
Ixen. And because I was in English spoken, I couldn't really speak, couldn't speak with the Afrikaans girls. Um, she also did confirm that she knew what happened to my son. And that was a huge relief for me, in a way, because I've blamed myself all these years for not being a responsible mother. He was on a ventilator. And what she confirmed was it, it what had nothing to do with his machine on how he died. You later learned that I have met Louise in 2019 again mm -hmm. and that she pointed out certain locations to me. Mm -hmm where photographs and, and videos were taken. Yeah. Do you recall that I have showed you a stack of photographs? You showed me a stack of photographs in 2019. <clears throat> many of that that are not suspects and many that are. And I honestly pointed out those that I knew and those that I didn't. Um, in 2020, you then showed me photos that Louise pointed out to you of certain locations where the girls were held and I told you that I could confirm of these places and you and was there and I gave you the correct names back then of what the clubs were some of them are not standing today there are garages and restaurants and whatever. But yes, I, in 2020 I did see the photographs of Louise pointing out certain places after she passed on. In 2019 January, shortly after we met, I showed you a stack of photographs. Yes. Including that of the missing girls. Yes. Including the six apparently kidnapped by a man you later learned as Gert van Rooyen. As Gert van Rooyen. Was it easy to identify the girls from the photographs? No, it wasn't. And I can tell you why. The pictures that were presented on these photographs were of happy children cared for children, children with either school uniform on or clothing, civvies clothing, they had no fear in their eyes. Um, the girls that I knew had fear in their eyes and that's not something that I can forget. Um, we were given different names in that, in, in that time period. So I also did not identify them on their names. I did not know their names at all prior to our meeting in 2019. Um, but as I said, there are many other girls that were involved or were kidnapped. So it's, it's very hard to take a child at, at that age all children have the same similarities. You can't say they differ. Um, you could pinpoint one child out that look that is another child. I have done that in 2019 with you in East London, and you asked me to point out a few of the girls, and I got their names mixed up. Um, I find that it's impossible for for anyone to have done that as a victim. If some of those girls are living today, I don't think they would have identified me as who I am. They would have known me as Smith or that little girl that was in the cupboard, so forth. That's how we would have identified each other. Subsequent to our meeting in January 2019, you had several doctor and dental 
visit. At one point, you were taken to a kind of practitioner. Correct. He was unfamiliar with your background or what happened to you in early life. In 2020, yes. Did he make any observations? He made quite a few. Um, after examining my body, he was very concerned and uh, told me that my body had been through a tremendous beat. Um, my spine, he finds it incredible that I'm walking today. Um, also the trauma on my head. Um, he can't believe that I'm alive and I'm actually speaking normally without having a stutter or a slur to my, to my speech. Um, he was quite amazed at that, even my eyesight. And he pinpointed out a few things that did happen in the past. He pinpointed where and he, with my neck, he, you could see that I was chained. Um, yeah, there was a lot of things that he did point out, but that will come out later with the evidence. At some point, a comprehensive blood analysis was done in 2019. Correct. Any of the findings on the report amazed you? Yes, it did. Because I went under as a Jane Doe. Um, the greatest thing that, that, that shocked me, that put me in a, in a terrible state, was my blood group. Why? Well, Leon, all my life, I have been living under a foul, under the name of Jacqueline Sloan, who is O negative. And without common sense, without thinking about it, um, I thought that was my blood group. And for many years, even in Sunny's Hall, um, that would be my blood group. And when I met this doctor, when we, when we took him to this doctor and we did run some tests, um, there were two things that, that, that the doctor pointed out in my test results. The one we will later on discuss. But the main one was the fact that I'm A positive and not O negative. So you got information years ago that you had a certain blood group. Correct. And you got this information from where? From Miss Porter. And it's also documented on the files that are at Addington Hospital, King Edward Hospital. So obviously, I assume Jacqueline Sloan was at those, those specific hospitals. As I've never opened a file, I've just received a file with my name, well, the name Jacqueline Sloan on it. And today we know you have a different blood group? Yes, it's been confirmed. Very expensive doctors. And they did a full blood count. And I'm A positive. If they didn't tell me that, I would still believe today that I'm O negative. And I was quite broken and emotional about that finding. <coughs> I want to go back to the tree in Clarendon, December 2019. When you eventually found your name carved out on the tree, mm -hmm. what were your emotions at the time? I was overjoyed. To know something all your life and to prove it to others, 
I never got it right. And when I climbed out the car and that fresh memory hit me like a breeze, it was straight out a confirmation, something that I could not make up. And when I got to the tree, I remember I told you, I, oh, I actually shouted at you and I said, I told you so. Um, yeah, it was a remarkable finding. It's something that confirms who I am and not claims to be. Why did you say, I told you so? You know, Leon, I think it's because of my battle all my life to find my identity and no one believed me and no one took interest in helping me. I think that was just a, an explosion of words to say, I, I told you I am this person. I told you I'm not lying. And uh, yeah, can't think of another explanation. If someone would say that your eyes are not the same as the kidnapped Fiona Harvey. It uh, frustrates me. I have aged and my eyes will never be the same as, a, as any childhood photo. Um, my eyes have seen, uh, my eyes have seen terrible things. I've witnessed deaths. I have seen terrible things. Um, and without that, withstanding that, I don't think any adult's picture would match that of their childhood picture. Yet there were similarities found between my picture and my little picture of me. And for Mr. to only state that the eyes are not the same, um, either he's hiding something or he's not willing to accept the responsibility that I have been found. During the, a normal day as an adult, from the moment you wake up, does something change with your eyes? Yes. Um, I've taken numerous photos for you, which I'd like you to show in my presentation, that my face swells up and it's done that since child. It's not it's got nothing to do with being kidnapped or being traumatized or I believe it's something to do with my health. Um, my face does swell up in the morning. My eyes look different in the morning, as it would now. Um, it all depends. And it's got nothing to do with pain, it's got nothing to do with trauma, and it's got nothing to do with being a different individual. I can show you a few pictures of little me, and I can tell you in four photos how the eyes differ. So, Mr. <laughs> statement on my eyes are not the same, which of those little Fiona's is his Fiona? Because all of their eyes differ. And I mean, I'm 43 years old today. Would my eyes match that of a 12 year old? Why was that his only, his only feedback? And of course the big question, why ignore the forensic finding of a renowned expert? Besides ignoring that forensic findings, why not do DNA? You know, you've, I've learned shortly after I've met you, and I mean, it was very difficult because when you did find the, well, the daughter, and Mr. had phoned you back, he clearly stated they made peace that their daughter was dead. And I know of other mothers who's desperately seeking for their child. And if something like this had to happen for any parent, 
I, I'm a mother. I would go and do the DNA tests. I would make sure this is my child. Um, instead of saying, sorry, mm, the eyes don't match. Please don't contact me again. Lee, thank you very much for your time and willingness to speak to me about your feelings and emotions regarding your past. I just pray and wish that the future will bring you the answers you are looking for on those aspects that we have not been able to uncover. Thank you so much.